Okay. Everybody, I mean, I talk pretty loud anyway. I usually don't need a mic. <laughs> One time I was demoing for the uh, uh, Ohio Valley Symposium, and everybody is in the same room. They have all the instructors with their backs to the wall, and all the speakers enter in the middle, pointing back toward the instructor to try to cut down on the noise level or the competing noise level. And then about a third of the way through the demo, they came by and said, could you talk a little softer? You're disturbing all the other demonstrators. <laughs> so, uh, one thing I do in my shop, I try to remember anyway, take my good glasses off, because I use a moderate amount of CA glue and you cannot get CA glue off plastic lenses. <laughs> totally ruined. Um, let me put these up real quick. I make a lot of hand mirrors over the years um, oops. in all kinds of styles. I've lost this skin. Apparently my ears shaped funny. Is that better? Can you hear? Am I still not? That goes toward the bottom. Hmm. Okay, I think I've got it, maybe. Does that look right? Yeah, <laughs> comes. Uh, I might have to tighten the band. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then probably pull the mic down a little bit lower, I would think. Okay, yeah, there we go. Anyway, um, the one thing I liked about them was they become... The, the mirror body kind of becomes a palette. You know, I can do anything to it. Any, anything you do in woodworking, anything you do in texturing, anything you do in airbrushing or whatever, you can, all, you can add to these things. So I do everything from simple airbrushing like that to, uh, well, I didn't bring any of the really exotic ones. <coughs> yeah, that's a little more a little more exotic where I do. I did a couple with the uh, Eclipse where I had the moon on it. <laughs> I've sold all of those. They're much, they are much more complicated than that. And, uh, any of the paints, I've been playing with the uh, Joe Sanyo iridescent paints. So I've got a lot of different mirrors that have this kind of pattern on them or something like that. Um, a lot of inlays. I'll talk a little bit about router inlays later when we do the uh, uh, tea light demo but uh, you know like I say basically anything I can think of that's my fake abalone using the uh, Joe Sanyo iridescent paints I was, I was surprised that came out that good but it did but you're welcome to come up here and look at these later if you want so it all starts out <clears throat> what I do is I, I see a glue with accelerator a block to the wood. The reason I use the accelerator is it's, it's fragile. So I can break this off without destroying my wood afterwards. In a lot of plate, a lot of cases, if it's done properly, I put a little bit of excess CA on this one this morning. But um, when I break this off, usually my glue block is okay and my wood's okay and I can reuse both of them. Um, when I teach classes, and I use this little, what I do is we take blocks that are I'd have to measure that again. I think it's three and an eighth. The diagonal is larger than four inches. My mirror of the glass that I use is four inches. So I teach classes most of the time, they don't have four inch jaws. They only have the two inch jaws. So what I do is I make a two inch block, I center drill it and put a dowel in there. I center drill these blocks, you know, on the drill press or whatever, if you happen to have a chuck, you can. And then what we do is we CA glue this to that, and then we CA glue that to it. Now what I can do is I can pop this off later. I'll talk about this more in just a few minutes when we get ready to reverse turn the mirror as to why I do that. How much super glue do you put on there? Just a little line? I, no, I just usually do a ring, a, a medium CA. It produces a fair bond. Uh, occasionally I've had CA glue that was old. When it gets old, it becomes more brittle, and so they break off easily. And I made myself this little guide. What I can do is I can draw diagonals and I can put that down through there and it allows me to line it up exactly where I want it. So like on the, the piece that I just told you where I had four bowls that were off center, well, it was real easy. You know, I marked the center of each bowl and I just run this through there 
to my mark, glue it on, it's ready to turn. The backside's ready to turn anyway. That's one easy way to do it. But I'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Uh, I used to use just a drill bit, but the dr and I kept getting my blanks done. And I'd go, why is there a hole in, my, in the good side of my blank? Well, it's because I was using a brad point bit, and that long point was poking a hole in them. <laughs> so I made myself a little piece that's dull to get that. But we're going to use a four-jaw chuck because it goes faster for the demo purposes. Um, one of the things I do is, for demo purposes especially, or if I'm using a brand new wood, I leave the wood square. I don't... You know, you could put it on the bandsaw and, and uh, turn it or cut away a lot of it. But the reason I do it like this is it allows me to test my tools and to test the wood. You know, if it's an unknown wood that I haven't turned before, I can kind of find out how it's cutting. And it also gives me a chance to, particularly with new turners, because you're cutting air, you have to be really light on the bevel. And I knew I brought this for a reason. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, oak or ash? I didn't look at it close. I think it's oak. I take it back. I think it's ash. So, you know, it'll cut hard, but... Um, let me turn that. There we go. Now, one of the things I try to teach people, when I'm cutting across there, first thing I'm doing is I try to rotate, and you'll notice I'm wearing a John Jordan t-shirt. John just passed away. Good friend of mine. Um, what John taught me was as you're making your cut, you rotate the flute real slightly clockwise or counterclockwise, and you find where it wants to cut. It will cut easier when you get to that point. So, you know, it takes, well, sorry about that. <laughs> Moving my hand away to show you something and stuck the tool into the wood. So what I'm doing is I'm rotating it really slightly. I'm trying to find out where this grind, this is somewhat of a new grind that I'm using, and I'm still learning some of the intricacies of it. Uh, I sharpen this on the vector grind that Johann Michelson teaches. And the reason I do that is the flutes on some of my tools get really acute. And they're so acute that when you're using a lot of pull cuts, you can chip the edge. And with the vector grind, it kind of rounds over that edge really slightly, which makes that wing a little bit thicker. And so you don't get the catches as bad. Well, you do get catches, but you don't. Uh, you don't, it didn't chip the tool. Um, but what you're doing, you know, what I'm doing is I'm rotating the tool a little bit. Right about there is the perfect angle. It's cutting by itself. You don't want to push the tool. Right at the very end of the cut, if your tool jumps out like that, that means you're putting too much pressure. You want to cut the wood only as fast as the wood wants to be cut. And to do that, you have to learn to cut with very light pressure. You know, I'm using almost no pressure on the tool. I'm letting it do the cutting. My left hand is not pushing at all. I'm just letting it go. And we'll see how it's doing on this wood. It's cutting extremely clean. If you're new to turning, the grain on my wood is running this direction. And so what you're going to get is this area and this area, you're cutting against the grain as it rotates. So you're always going to get a worse cut. Uh, when you learn how to rotate the tool properly, yeah, there's no tear out at all on this. When you're not pushing the tool and you're, and you're rotating it properly, you'll get a really clean cut. See, I'm, what I'm trying to do, that's one of the reasons on all of my tools, you'll notice I have a very, very small main bevel, just two millimeters or so. And the reason I do that Everything beyond that area is, is inconsequential. It doesn't affect the cut at all. But that allows me to feel the cut better. When you have that convex grind, and you know it goes all the way up to your tip, it's hard to feel the cut as well. So I want to feel the cut because I want the wood to cut as clean as possible. 
reduces my sanding time. You know, and especially at the very end, you know, I don't want to push it off because it'll actually break the wood out, damage the other side of my mirror. We've got it almost one more pass and that'll be good enough. And of course, ideally, you should be looking up here to see the shape rather than looking at the cutting edge. We'll flatten this out. Um, I'm doing a pull cut on this. I don't want it, I just want to get it out of the way, get it flat. And I do all the pull cuts with my body. What you do is you have the flute pointing up like this. So, and it's rubbing so it's not cutting. You rotate it till it starts to cut and then you pull it towards you. Ideally, I like to have the tool rest lower because when the tool rest is really low, this whole distance becomes your bevel so you won't get a catch. When you have the tool up like this, you know, all I have to do is rotate it a hair too far and I get a catch. But if I can lower that tool handle, I don't. But all I'm interested in right now is getting it flat. Uh, <clears throat> You can use a compass, whatever you got, dividers. I built this because I make a lot of hand mirrors. And so it stays the same all the time. Put that in the center. Mark that. Take my parting tool. And make the opening for my mirror glass. That's about deep enough. Um, I cut, instead of going in here and cutting like that, which I could do, it takes a while because you're cutting right against the grain. I prefer to cut across the grain. Just kind of lever it down like that. I've got the flute pointing up just a little bit. I'm cutting with that lower wing. And really what I'm doing is really a scrape. I don't care about the quality of that part. Then I go back with a push cut. Now in this case, what I'm going to do is, because this is a fairly heavy wood and I'm probably going to leave the body a little thicker than normal, I actually hollow it out a little bit. I only need an area, I'm losing that earpiece again. <laughs> I must have weird shaped ears. Yeah, super glue and, well shoot, I can't keep it on there. Maybe that'll work. Um, you only need about, you know, three-eighths of an inch or so to put your glue on to glue the glass in. So it doesn't really matter if this is hollow, but you have to be careful because if you hollow it too much, you turn the mirror around, you end up with a funnel mirror. <laughs> Don't want to do that. Now, um, I built myself a go-no-go -no -go gauge years ago, and you can see it fits. It's, it's actually kind of snug. It fits, but that's okay. Um, what I want is... If you make the opening the same size as the glass, when the wood shrinks and, and expands during the seasons, it can break your mirror or break the wood, one or the other. So what I do is rather than make it larger than I need to be, then you have a big gap around the glass, which I don't like. So what I do is I take my spindle roughing gouge and I sharpen my spindle gouges with my Wolverine jig, just like I do my bowl gouges. That's why they all have wings. The, the re big advantage of that for me is this particular cut that I'm doing right now. What I want to do is undercut it so that my glass, has, I use tapered glass. If I undercut it, the wood can shrink and move around the glass and I don't have to enlarge that opening. So what I do is I put the flute pointing directly straight back at me. I touch the bevel, I push it in, and I twist it. Now by twisting it, what happens is that lower wing is doing the cutting and it's shaping it as a, you know, because it's, this is V-shaped, so it's actually undercutting it just like my glass. So I do that, and then what I do is I lower the handle, get these out of the way, I lower the handle so it's shear scraping, and I drag it back around and I shape that area. John, can you hold the tool under the camera for your, 
it? This one? Yeah. It's just, it's like my bowl gouges. Um, it has a very small main bevel. It has a secondary bevel. This one, again, I, I changed my sharpening jigs uh, a little bit. And so all of my tools now have like four or five bevels instead of three. <laughs> the reason I do three bevels is you need the main bevel, of course. That's what does the cutting. I try to keep it small. Then I produce a secondary bevel to get all the wood out of the way because if the metal is not scraping across the wood, you have no friction, which makes it easier for you to feel the cut. I always grind away this bottom corner. The reason I do that is when you're turning bowls, if you're going down through the bowl and you hesitate even a, a tiny bit, that sharp corner will burnish the wood. You see it, you sand it out. When you put your finish on, it comes back because you've crushed the wood. It won't take the finish the same way. Um, and so I always do that on all my tools. Um, another trick that I use sharpening wise is this may be sharpened at 40 degrees. This one may be sharpened at 35, whatever. What I do is since I have CBN wheels now and the wheel never changes size, my V arm is locked in the same position. It never moves. So what I want to do is when I change from this tool to this tool, I put a little V block in there. And I've, and I've made the V block long enough to sharpen at 40 or 30 or 35. I've got several V blocks. I drop those in there. My Wolverine jig goes against that. So what it does is, because nothing ever changes, <clears throat> when I go back to sharpen a tool, I remove almost no steel at all because I haven't had to. It goes in the Wolverine jig the same way. The Wolverine jig goes in the V arm. The V arm's locked down. Nothing can change. So these two tools are sharpened with the Wolverine jig. The only difference is I put a V block in there. And I've, they got little magnets they stick to my grinder. I, just, I pull the 35 degree off or the 40 degree or whichever and drop it in there and sharpen them. So that's how I sharpen my tools. Where, where, which, there we are. I'll find you in a minute. There we go. So it's, uh, maybe I can get it to focus on my hand. Yeah. It's hard to see it real well, but now this one, because I'm using, this one was sharpened with the vector grind instead of the Wolverine jig. Um, the, the vector grind, what you do is you, it's got three holes and you put the jig in one hole and sharpen the nose. Then you put the jig in the right-hand hole, sharpen this wing, the left-hand hole, sharpen that wing. What that does, it rolls the tool over. So instead of the wing being like this, the wing is kind of like that. So it makes that wing, like I say, it makes it a little thicker so it doesn't chip as bad. Uh, Johannes Michelson claims it's catch-free. I haven't found an amateur that's catch-free. <laughs> <laughs> the tool does work really well that way. But uh, anyway, so I've ground that. I've, one thing I do is... I showed you that I put it in here like this. I lower the handle. I pull it out and shear scrape. Because you're cutting against the grain coming out this way, what I usually do is I go back in this way and clean it up because it cut, it's cutting downhill with the grain, so it leaves it a little cleaner because that's really hard to sand. Uh, so anyway, uh, the problem is when you go back this way, if you stick the nose into the tool, it runs back like that. <laughs> scares the hell out of you. So anyway, once I've got that done... I think my shield is hitting it. <laughs> it's part of what the problem is. Um, I do a little pull cut. I want to do the this shape, whatever I want to shape right here. And I started off as a pull cut, but what I'll do is I'll drop the handle. I'm pulling across here. I drop the handle, and now it becomes a push cut. So it allows me to cut that bead or that corner very accurately. And I only want to go about that far. I'm going to finish this part later when I do the other side. I didn't get it perfect. I've got just ever so slight facet on there. Uh, you can shear scrape to get that out of the way if you want to. Shear scraping is I lower the handle. I use that bottom wing. The flute's pointed toward this. I use the bottom wing and I pull it real gently like that. It's not an aggressive cut. You have to be really light because it's not going to cut as clean as using the bevel. 
So it's going to require just a hair more sanding, although that's pretty darn good right there. I wouldn't worry about that. And I didn't do, I was not paying attention when I was showing you all this, so we'll make one more cut right there. There we go. I didn't have the bevel all the way against the bottom, so there was a ridge in there that the mirror would sit on. Um, so. I'm going to tell you that in a few minutes. <laughs> Don't let me forget it, though. The two things I forget to tell people is where I get my mirrors and how I glue them in. And I want to remember that. Um, because we used the accelerator, and I glue my block on so the grain is the same direction as the grain of the wood. So that way, when I chisel this off, and it's not really the chisel action that does it. It's the impact. So you got to hit it good and hard. <laughs> it hit my face shield. And in theory, it fractures the glue line. And you can still use your glue block. Yeah, that's pretty good. Still use my glue block, still use this. So it didn't hurt anything at all. Now what I do, I was telling you earlier, if you go with a two inch chuck and you don't have four inch jaws, this piece is wider than my hole. It won't go in there. So what you do is, I put that on there and I start off cutting at a slight angle. What I wanna do is knock the corners off until it exactly fits in that opening. And that's how I get this to square up to turn the back side of the mirror. Everybody follow that? In other words, what I'm doing is making a jam chuck out of this square piece. Now, why do I use a square piece for a jam chuck? I gotta glue it in there and get it back out. If it's round, how am I gonna get it back out? <laughs> if it's square, I can stick my chisel in there, do exactly what I just did, pop it out, and I'm done. Uh, but we're gonna go ahead and just use the four inch jaws because Takes a whole lot less time than doing all that. The one thing I found about doing the taper, doing the angle, you know, you could, if you're careful, cut straight across here until it exactly fits your circle. The problem is it's so easy to miss. And if you miss just a few thousands, then it doesn't line up. I found if you cut it at an angle and you miss, you can, you can take a little wood off the face and now it fits perfectly. So it allows you to sneak up on the joint, which is a lot nicer. I use that CA accelerator trick a lot on all my stuff because uh, it's just so easy to glue glue blocks on. Yep, and it just it makes the joint brittle. You have to watch that when I'm teaching classes sometimes because they'll get catches. A catch can pop it off, <laughs> so sometimes you have to deal with that. Most of the time, it's pretty good. It takes a fair amount of impact. But like I said, if your glue gets old, I was demoing at Phoenix, Arizona, and I had to buy glue there because I couldn't take glue on the plane. And when I got there, I was turning platters and I kept throwing platters off. I mean, like three times in a row. I went, what the hell? So a guy ran out and bought me a fresh bottle, another fresh bottle, and that bottle worked perfectly. So that's when I became aware that it was the age of the glue that causes problems. Um, so what we'll do now, it's the same basic thing. I'm going to show you a couple tricks here. Again, I try to lower the tool rest. I want my gouge ideally to be as low as it can go. When I first started turning mirrors, I wanted the middle to be high. I wanted it to slope out toward the edges. Well, that means that you need to turn this direction because I want to turn downhill with the grain. The grain's, the grain's running like that, and I want to cut this way. So... In order to, to do this, I was cutting like this with a push cut. And your arm's way out here, and every time you moved your arms, you got a little bit of a ripple. You didn't get a really smooth curve. So I started doing a pull cut because I could have the tool against my body. And, you know, everybody talks about, I didn't know David Ellsworth back in those days. I kind of developed that on my own. Uh, but he talks about dancing with the lathe, which means... You do all your cuts with your body. You have so much more control when you do that. Um, so I developed this tool. <laughs> Look at the wings on that sucker. <laughs> you know, it's about a, about a mile long. Uh, and I would put my tool rest really, really low. Because again, you're rubbing that long bevel. You're not going to get a catch. Just pull it across. It cut really well doing that. And I learned to do it pretty good. 
it was still hard if you wanted to leave a bead on the surface or something like that. I still couldn't do that. I still had to do that push cut. But one day it dawned on me, what if I walk around to the back side of the lathe? <clears throat> and I don't know if y'all will be able to see this or not. But now I'm doing a push cut, but my body's controlling the cut. So I was getting really, really clean cuts doing that. Well, this was before everybody had reverse on the lathe. Does this have reverse? Yeah, there's a switch. <laughs> So now what I can do is I can simply do exactly the same cut, but I'm doing it from the center out. Now another trick I learned from John Jordan, almost everybody, and y'all haven't done it yet, is do you have a set screw in here? Keep it from unscrewing? You don't need it. What I found was, and I, used to, I went through the phase where you used the plastic washers in between the whole nine yards. Uh, if you lube your spindle and the spindle faces, and you wipe all the lube off. You're not ever gonna get it all off. It's, it's always gonna leave a microscopic layer. You put your chuck on hand tight, you tighten that up, push it like that, it will lock on, it won't come off, and it's just as easy to get it back off then. You, don't, you, haven't, you know that when you snap it on like that, sometimes it's really hard to get them off. If you do this method, it comes right off with very little effort. Um, in all the years I've been turning, I've lost one bowl turning in reverse. That was a 20 inch bowl. I guess I just had too much friction, too much leverage, and it just came loose and hit the rest. It didn't hurt anything, but it's kind of scary. <laughs> but what I found now, you know, I have all this control because it's against my body. I can make a really delicate cut. Did I put it back in reverse? Yeah. About half the time when I'm doing demos, I'm talking to the crowd. And I'm forgetting what I do, and I forget to put it back and forward when I go back to the next cut. <laughs> That's real embarrassing. Um, so what I do is, I cut that. Now, what I want to do is, I want to put a little bead on here. And so I can't really cut the bead in this direction. So i got to put the lathe back and forward. And, and, I'm, and I'm cutting, I'm going to start off doing pull cuts. So that I tear less grain. If I've done it properly that way, I get a pretty good cut. I got a little bit of, there's little tiny lines in there. One of the tricks that I found was, and that's why I sharpened this tool wherever it is. Um, this is kind of my version of the Stuart Batty tool, except mine's at 35 degrees instead of 40. Um, because it's sharper, <clears throat> a more acute edge, I won't say sharper because all my tools are sharp, sharp, but a more acute edge will cut cleaner than a blunter edge most of the time. So in this case, if I want to do a push cut, I'm cutting against the grain. So I want to use the, the sharpest edge that I can to cut against the grain. So let's clean it up like that. Find my cut. Again, I'm trying to push extremely gently. Now, another trick, as you probably didn't see me do on there, when I'm, when I'm rotate, pushing it in like that, and I get up close to this edge right here, if you hit that edge hard, it'll get a catch, because it'll grab the tool, it'll pull it down like that, and it can tear up that surface. So what I do is, I go ahead and rotate the tool so that surface is already down. Now when I bump against that edge, it's not going to catch. All it does is, is do a little bit of scraping. So it's a very safe cut. So again, it's something you can't see when I'm doing it because it's so subtle. As I push the gouge through, I slowly rotate it. And when, and when I get to that last edge, I've already got it rotated so the wing is down and it can't get a catch. Um, I got that. Okay. So then all I do, I can use this tool or I can use my bowl gouge. I want to round this over into a bead shape. And then I come back and do the backwards this direction. It didn't, didn't quite move my handle far enough. The trick when doing these is not to push. You know, you keep the bevel rubbing 
and you try not to force it. You try to let it cut. And uh, so that's pretty clean right there. Okay, let's say, for example, that I didn't... Well, I want to round that corner over before I do this part of the demo. So we'll go back to my bowl gouge. And... Now what I do is I put the flute up. I'm rubbing the bevel so it won't cut. I lift the handle up and I rotate the tool. Right there it starts to cut. And I move it with my body. And that's my cut. Should be nice and clean. Now let's suppose, for example, that you didn't get as clean a cut as I just got with these. These would take very little sanding. I do have a bump right there because I didn't go back and correct that. This top part's ever so slightly pointed. I didn't pull my tool handle around far enough. For those of you who are new, this tool handle is like steering a boat. You know, I want to move the boat left or right, I got to move the handle. Same way on this. When I want to cut a bead, it's important to move that handle. If all you do is rotate the tool, and I'll show you that when we do spindles, you create a V-shaped bead. What happened here was I didn't pull the handle far enough, so it ended up being V-shaped instead of rounded. I needed to pull a little further, but I'll show you a little trick on that. Um, we're going to go. I don't use scrapers a whole lot anymore. Um, I, well, I do when it needs to, and I did my sharpening jig. Um, got such a small burr I can barely feel it <laughs> so what I'm going to do is it's a ceramic rod and I'm just going to create a burr this particular tool I don't know why it's an off-brand that I bought a hundred years ago um, it doesn't raise a burr off the grinder worth of crap my Thompson tool raises a fantastic burr right off the same wheel 180 grit uh, but this one won't so I have to raise it by hand on this one uh, now <clears throat> Most of my gouges, most of my scrapers are negative rake. I don't use them very often as an actual negative rake in this position. You could. Uh, the advantage of a negative rake is all of the force goes straight down to the tool rest. If I take a regular scraper and I hold it up like this, I used to think, oh, that's a negative rake now. It's not. The forces are pulling it into the wood. It's sliding across your tool rest. So that's why a negative rake... As ideally, a negative rake is an extremely light cut, and all the forces go down to the tool rest so you get a cleaner cut because you can control it better. What I learned years ago, this is before I used a negative rake, was I wanted to take very gentle cuts, and I had trouble doing it. So I found that if I hold it up like this, I say you're not going to get a catch, and I throw it into it. That's really smart. We'll have to correct that. <laughs> Oops, my lid came off. Yeah, I like, well, I like to get catches to show everybody it can be done. <laughs> so we'll take the bowl gouge. Go back and clean that up real quick. Still, still a little deep right there. This is what happens when you haven't done demos in two years because of the COVID. <laughs> you make silly mistakes. There's my bill. What I was going to show you was when you're, when you're touching it in the wood, the reason I got the catch, I stuck it in on the uphill side. I wasn't, I was watching y'all not paying attention. Over here, see, it's not going to get a catch. So what I would do is just very gently with my finger, just pull it across. I get the tiniest little shavings. Now I'm using the, well, the corner and the middle. For example, right, I'm going to tape, I'm going to glue that thing to my ear. <laughs> um, when I'm trying to clean up that corner right where the bead is, I use the very corner of the tool. Stick it in there real gently like that. And then, and then I flatten it out a little bit and use that edge. You know, didn't get my bead quite right. But because it's such a steep angle, it's not going to get a catch. You know, I can just play what I want to on there and get it right. Uh, 
You know, I go up here again. What I'm doing is I'm barely supporting with my fingers. Now, if you're nervous about that, don't do it. You know, use it like a regular negative rake scraper and pull it across. I got one area right there. What angle do you use on the Uh, Less than 90 total. Um, this one is probably a little finer than that. What I do on my negative rake scrapers, and some I don't, but some I do, most of them I do, I try to make the bevel exactly the same on both sides. So what I can do is when I go to the grinder, I flip it over, sharpen this side, it's raising the bevel. I don't have to do both sides. Now my, uh, my round bowling scraper has a really long wing on the left side, so I can't do that with that one. I have to grind it. I still do it on mine. I grind that one away, flip it back, and grind it the other. But most of the time, you'd be better off just polishing off that burr with a diamond hone and then raise it with this or raise it with a grinder to get that. Uh, is it okay just to sharpen to one side, though? I mean, if yeah. the top angle... Well, it. what you're trying to do is you want to get rid of the, the old burr and then sharpen it so you raise a new burr. Okay. Either, either, either. I mean, you either raise a new burr this way or you raise it with a stone. Um, but the reason, the reason you want to polish off the old burr, burr is because it's torn. You know, the reason the thing won't cut anymore. And Stuart Batty says 15 seconds. I found with my Thompson tools, I get quite a bit longer, 30, 45 seconds, before I really need to refinish the burr. Uh, but if you're not lifting little shavings floating away, you're not doing it right. In other words, let's use it like a regular scraper. Set that there. One of the other advantages of a negative rake scraper is a scraper always has to have the handle higher than the cutting edge. Well, with negative rake, since you've got this tilted anywhere from 10 to 30 degrees, you can go in, you can be off level just a tiny bit. It's not going to grab on you. So we'll go in there and we'll use it like a regular scraper. And what I have to do is I have to find that burr. I may have to lift the handle up more than normal. There we go. So... Because your burr sometimes will be this angle, sometimes it'll be that angle. It just depends on how you roll it. And so sometimes you have to move that handle to find that burr. And the same thing with this. Uh, when I'm touching it, if it's not cutting, I may have to move it like that to get it to cut. Uh, but it gets pretty clean. I'll go back and do the same. Oops. right ear maybe I think what's happening is this cord is getting pulled we'll try that yeah there you go pull that way down do it yeah okay cool um, like I said this becomes a pallet now, I can do anything I want to do. I'm going to do some texturing, and we'll talk about texturing tools a little later. Uh, these are the Sorby Mini texturing tools. You buy the tool, you get various cutters. I made handles for all of mine, so all, I can easily just swap back and forth now. Um, the other tool that's, that's nice, where did I put it? There it is. It's called the Elf. The what? It's called the Elf. Elf. Made by, you know who it's made by, Sammy? My mind just went blank. It's not Robert Sorby. Henry huh? Henry Taylor. Henry Taylor, that's right, you're right. Um, there's plans on how to make this in either American Woodturner or, or Woodturning Fundamentals. I, they had an article published, oh, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago on how to make this. Very simple tool. All it is is a Dremel cutter that fits in a handle. There's no bearing involved. Uh, I put a magnet down in there like the original so that it kind of sucks in and won't fall back out. But since the tool is always used this way, you don't need the, the magnet. You just remember, you got to remember when you put your tool back up to pull that out or, or hang it vertically. But the way they work is, put this fairly low, pull my tool rest out so that arm doesn't get in the way. There we go, a little bit lower. And you turn the lay speed down. I'm going to hit that arm, but I think I can do it. What kind of bar is that? Huh? What kind of bar? It's round. I, I, it's just a standard round. Oops. Um, 
Yeah, standard round Dremel cutter. I've used the football shaped ones. I've used the uh, long cylinder shaped ones. The football shaped one and this one, I can't see make any difference in the cut. So it was a waste of time buying that cutter. The, the, two, the cylinder shaped one, <clears throat> I only use the edges, the sharp edge. I don't use the side of it at all. No, it's, it's just totally round. See if we can get it to focus. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, it's like a quarter inch round is all it is. Um, but you put it on there like that, and you pull it out. You can rotate it a little bit if you want it. And what it produces is like a spiral pattern that's pretty nice. It's going to be hard to see until we put some kind of stain on it or whatever. Uh, these tools use at a fairly slow speed. The one that looks like a bicycle gear, most of the time I run straight back and forth. Sometimes you tilt it, but whenever you tilt any of these cutters, you're going to get some lift grain, tear out kind of things, and you have to kind of sand that away. Uh, so this one, I would go in there and just kind of put a little texture like that. And then what I do is I go back and use whatever tool you got handy. A lot of people use those V uh, the three wing gouges. I use the toe of my skew. And what you want to do is kind of highlight the edges. It kind of offsets, kind of shows off the detail better. And what I'll do typically, I'll hit those really lightly with 600 grit just to knock the fuzzies off. The other thing that I do is when I put finish on is I use these gun patches. It was easier than using a t-shirt and cutting a t-shirt up. If you use paper towels, it gets caught in all these little fibers that you'd used texturing tools with. Um, I, I finished mine with uh, Minwax Wipe on Poly. Um, but that's the basics of the body. I'm going to show you something else. Has anybody got any questions on that? We'll pass this around in a minute. I'm going to turn the handle, and I'm going to show you how and why and where I drilled the hole, and we'll talk about that detail. Let's give you that. And so we'll put these back real quick. Well, I'm not going to use the scraper anymore. Uh, to turn the handle, whoops. What I like to use is a little 3 8 inch, uh, similar to the, uh, shoot, I can't think of what they call that. Sorby sells that one with the teeth. Um, I didn't bring the big, oh, yeah, I did too. That's similar to that. Step, step center, is that what they call them? Yeah. yeah I use a mini step center that I bought somewhere. Uh, the reason I do is my tenons are 3 eighths of an inch. And we'll just eyeball this. Well, I did mark it beforehand, so I got lucky. I use a cone center, or not a cone center, a uh, cup center, so it won't split the wood. Put that on there. There we go. I'm not sure, 10 and 3 quarters, I think. Might be a little longer. Um, what I do, I'll show you that in a second once I get this rounded out. Um, when I'm doing... Now, my spindle roughing gouge, a lot of them come from the factory ground really blunt. I grind mine at about 40 degrees, 45 degrees. It seems to hold an edge well enough not to chip, but it cuts cleaner, and I'll show you why I do that in a second. Another thing that I do is, when I first learned how to use a parting tool, we did everything like that. 
Well, what I found was, particularly when you were turning, say, chair legs and you were leaving a square bolster at the top, um, if you're going back like this and you hit that corner and the wood's not perfectly true, it can chip out and you just ruined your piece. So I found that I can push the tool in. The flute's pointed that way a little bit, so it always cuts downhill across the green. So by doing that, I get a really clean corner if I needed that corner, but also I don't tear it out so it doesn't damage my, my spindle. Now right at the very end, I'll go the opposite direction. But what I do is I push it in until I see the shadow disappear. Then you know it's round. So I find it goes very fast doing it that way. So then I take my little tool here that's got details already in it. My little story stick. Um, actually, I'm not going to use that this end. What I found was when I'm using three-quarter inch wood to make my mirrors and three-quarter inch wood to make the handles, the handles are kind of ugly. When I, when I, I don't have one in front of me that's blunt. Or do I? Yeah, okay, here we go. Um, this looks nice when you're starting with a one inch handle. When you're starting with three quarter inch, the handle is too, too skinny. So I developed this double taper that I think looks a lot nicer. Since I started this one with a one inch, I'm not going to do this part. I'm just going to do the rest to show you how that works. Um, so I take my parting tool. I've already put my lines in there. And then I'm going to make a 3 8 inch tenon. Now my drill bit has yellow paint on it, and this has yellow paint on it. The reason is I found that all winches are not exactly the same size as your drill bit. So what I did was I got a drill bit, I drilled a hole, and then I made this match, that hole. <laughs> so I know now that if I put that down there and I cut, and I do it till it just drops over, and that's perfect. Now I found that over the years, this is worn, so I go back and I reduce it a hair more. Take that down. I want to take this down visually. I'm just going to try to make that roughly the same. Get rid of a little bit of waste. I want to make this area a little smaller. In fact, I'm going to make two beads. We'll make that be a little smaller than the other one. Now what I'll do sometimes is this is really just a mini uh, skew. So what I'll do sometimes, I'll go ahead and take this and I can round the corners off. I can't do it completely because it won't reach in there. But it kind of gets rid of a little bit of the waste. And we'll decide right about there is going to be the end of my handle. So I want to get rid of some of that. Now what I've done by making this 3 8 and that small is now I've created a, basically a 10 and a half inch long 3 8 inch dowel. It wants to chatter. I'm going to show you what to do about that in a second. Um, but normally what I do is I decide where I want details using my spindle roughing gouge. Now I grind my spindle roughing gouges with reasonably square wings, you know, basically kind of up and down. The reason I do that is now this is like a right-hand skew, this is a left-hand skew. So if I want to clean that surface up, I can cut about a third of the way down. Can you all see how much more glossy that is? Because it's cutting like a skew. And then I get down here and I can do the same thing. But what I've done by doing it this way, it takes me longer to sharpen my skew than it does my spindle roughing gouge. 
So I'll use this until I can't use it anymore and then go to the skew. And that way I don't have to spend as much time sharpening this thing. Uh, yeah, I find that works really well. Um, one of the things y'all probably notice, this is something I'm trying. I've been playing with so many different tool grinds and, and I'm setting up a new, I bought a, um, a tool rest from Woodturner's Wonders. Um, it's, and then what I did was I drilled extra holes in it for every five degrees that he doesn't already have indexed. I used to use the robo rest all the time instead of the one that comes with your one-way system because the robo rest has a, an indentation every five degrees. Problem is he's not making those anymore. So I wanted to find a tool rest that I could recommend to other people that would have that capability. <clears throat> the Woodturner's Wonders tool rest locks in about four different positions. But if you don't want those positions, what I did, I put my little level on there and I would adjust uh, every five degrees I drilled a hole uh, in both parts. So I've got a little one eighth inch Allen wrench and I can just stick that one eighth inch Allen wrench in there and then the thing will lock in any position. It doesn't have to be. But now I've got indexed positions for every five degrees. <clears throat> so what I've done is I put marks on my tools now. Unfortunately, these little stickers fall off. I gotta find a better system. But every tool's marked with whether I'm using the platform, whether I'm using the, ver the uh, vector jig, or whether I'm using the Wolverine jig. So it's got a, a P, a V, or whatever. Uh, and it's got the degrees. So now, because I have so many tools, I don't have to remember and try to go up there and go, is that the right angle? And it's already written on my tool. So kind of saved me some hassle. So we'll make a bead right about there. Now I have a video. If you go to um, John Lucas Woodturner, uh, you can find all of my videos. I have one called Skew Practice 2. What Skew Practice 2 is, it takes you through a series of steps to learn to turn a bead. You start off turning barrels, and then you turn spheres, and then you turn beads. And by practicing that, you get really good with the skew in very short order. Um, so we'll, I'm going to cut this a little bit deeper at an angle. And do that. I stuck my toe into it. And then I'm going to cut that down. When you're using a skew, you're always cutting with the lower third. When you get right here, where I'm real close to that bead, I want to be cutting with the heel. And the reason is, when I get right there it won't cut so it won't damage that bead <clears throat> and i've got to lower this a little bit uh, to turn a bead there's three movements you have to rotate the tool you have to swing the tool and the reason you have to swing the tool is because your your bevels from your grind are at an angle and if you want a parallel sided bead it has to match that angle when i finish the cut so i have to rotate it I have to move it this way, and I have to lift the handle because I'm cutting from the high point here down to the low point of that bead. So that's why it gets kind of complicated because I'm trying to do all three of those movements. And I found that, again, if I use my body, I use my body for that left and right part, then all I have to concentrate on is the rotating and the lifting. Uh, and it's a little bit easier then to, to turn a bead. Most people, when they get a catch on a bead, the reason is they've rotated it too fast and come off the bevel. When you come off the bevel and you hit that heel, it's automatically going to run uphill on you. And you'll see that generally that direction I'm worse than this direction. And left-handed I'm worse than right-handed. You just got to practice. Now if you use a spindle gouge to do the same thing. It's the exact same movement. It's a little bit easier for most people to do that. See, I'm, I'm rotating the tool. I'm moving my body. I'm lifting the handle. Keep going. There we go. Anybody have a question? I thought I heard something. Um, now, the disadvantage of using a spindle gouge for this 
I want this bead to be really deep or fairly deep, and it's hard to do it. I can do it with that spindle gouge, but it really takes concentration to get in there. I've got the flute turned totally sideways. With a skew, because the bottom is sharper, I can reach down in there easier. So we'll just do this one. Yeah, see, I got a catch because I wasn't paying attention. Roll it, roll it. There we go. We'll roll it the other way. If you need to, you turn it over and use the V-cut to kind of clean that up a little bit. Um, I want my handle. Yeah, that's pretty good. We'll do... Yeah, I'm going to do a V. Turn that down like that. I'm going to put a little bitty sphere on the bottom. bead right there now one of the things I do is at this stage is when I would sand a little concentration there Okay, so what I want to do is two things. Number one, I don't want to cut this off by, by keep cutting down. If you cut it off like this, what's going to happen is it tears out the fibers and they go really deep into the end of that bead. I don't want to do that. So what I do is I cut it off so it's kind of shaped like this. In other words, I, I start the gouge over and then I'll do like that. And that makes this kind of pointed. So now it's going to break off right there. I can carve this away. I don't have that tear out because the tear out goes amazingly deep. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to show you real quick was one of the things that I find when I'm sanding spindles is, you know, you're going like this and you're sanding away and it produces these lines that are hard to get rid of. I found you're always better off to stop and hand sand if you can because you're, 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 you're cutting away all those scratches from whatever that grit was. Uh, the other thing is don't skip grits. I didn't talk about chatter, did I? I meant to. Um, when you're turning long, thin spindles, you get a lot of chatter a lot of times. I got the tiniest amount right there at the top of that. What I found is if you turn the lathe on, you back it off till this quits rotating, give it just a little bit. The pressure from that can create chatter. If you're using a step center, the little center pin is spring-loaded. The spring is so strong on some of them, it creates chatter. So I took my step center apart, cut off part of the link, put it back together, so now that spring center doesn't push on it. Then the third thing you do is, and this is why I'm using, I typically use my, uh, this is a robust mini center, but it has a large one inch post on it. The reason I like that so much for turning these kind of spindles is, I can put my finger on the back side and dampen all the vibrations. If it's burning your fingers, you're putting too much pressure on the bevel. It's very, very light pressure if you want to get rid of that chatter. We'll get rid of that chatter right there. Maybe we will. It's trying to chatter again, but no, it's okay. It's got a little bit of a spiral. Yeah, what it is, is that the whole thing is actually flexing, and it'll create these spirals. Now, the nice thing about the spiral is if you get a clean cut, don't worry about the spirals. They sand away better than a bad cut. So if you're getting bad cuts, you know, practice your techniques more. 
But a lot of times when it's chattering and, cre and creating that chatter, and you go back and maybe use a scraper, a scraper is never going to leave a, a wood as clean as a cutting tool. So I'm going to have to do a lot more sanding. But if I got really minor chatter, rather than using my scraper to get rid of it, just sand it away. It sands away easier than deep tear out from a scraper, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, well, this, okay, this will work. Now, the reason I didn't use this, my tool rest is, my post is longer because I have a 3520. So I have to have my tool way up in the air to do this, but we'll do it anyway. So what I want to do is I want to cut that little kind of a cone. Now I actually got chatter then because I forced the cut. So we'll, we'll just cut that cone until it drops off. And then when you pull out your redneck knife and you carve that away. My sister insulted me one time. She said, do you have a knife? I said, you don't ask a redneck if he has a knife. You don't know how big it is, but you know he's got a knife. Yeah, that's definitely ash. It cuts hard. <laughs> so I go to the bandsaw. I tilt it up like this, and I cut this little step off. At the same time, I round the end slightly. Then to, let's talk about mirror handles real briefly. Uh, if you make your mirror really thin, let's see, you have to make a choice. I don't want it to be up this way, especially if I have a cove, because when I drill the hole, I can actually drill into that cove, and then you got a hole there. So you mount your handle like that. Now that leaves, I guess I can boot under the camera, couldn't I? Um, you know, you got to have a fairly long tenon then, and it's going to show a little bit. You have to carve it away when you're done, but it works. Um, if you do this kind of detail, uh, you have to decide where, I'm, where am I going to drill it? You know, I move it up, down, whatever, but I've got it on both sides. It, sometimes you do drill through to the inside. That's okay. I'm using epoxy. I carve that away. Um, this is a worse detail. See how thin that is? There's no way, you know, you got to put, you got to decide how that tenon is going to go in there. It's going to show no matter what I do if I make the mirror that. So you're better off leaving it moderately thick like this one, where when I drill it, you don't see it very much. If you're going to have it show at all, have it show on this side. It'll actually look like a dovetail sometimes. It looks like you did it on purpose, which is kind of cool. Um, they... One of the problems you run into occasionally, you know, I didn't have enough meat here. It actually broke. This, this mirror was fairly old before it broke. Um, but uh, I keep that one around to show everybody what happened. One of the reasons I started undercutting mirrors, I was uh, selling my mirrors out at the craft center, and Gail called me one day and said, the glass is distorted. It shows the image bad. I got the mirror, and I picked it up, and I looked at it, and it looked perfect. And I said, Gail, does it look perfect to you? When I turned it around, the mirror itself had split. Apparently, at first, it had simply flexed the glass until it actually broke the, the wood. So that's when I started undercutting, so the wood has room to move for the glass. What do I glue them? Do what? No, I've had a bunch. <laughs> the first day I started working at Tennessee Tech, we had this booth. Where, we, where people could change clothes and stuff to get ready to do portraits or whatever they wanted to do. And uh, anyway, we decided it would be a good idea to put a mirror on the inside of the door that you closed so they had a full-length mirror to look at skirts or whatever. So I, I glued this mirror on this wall, and I called my boss, said, Dean, look what I did. And I, and I shut the door, and I opened it. Well, as soon as I shut the door, the mirror fell off the backside, <laughs> busted about a million pieces. Totally embarrassing. Um, Let's see. Yeah, this is when, when I first started making mirrors. That's how they were all done, with a router. And I, and I routed out these letters, which took forever. Had to fine carve them. And then I stamped these with a, uh, a nail set. Took about a billion stamps. I made 25 of these for Christmas gifts. I was so tired of stamping. The downside of this is, you see how much dust it's picked up over the years? That's really, really hard to clean. So when I make a mirror like this, now what I do is I coat it with epoxy. So the mirror is perfectly level as far as the surface. You don't get that dust. Because that's, 
it's one of the things you kind of learn over the years of doing that. Um, drilling the mirror. Uh, on my drill press at home, I have a little V block. It clamps in there because I do so many mirrors. They're ready to go. But I found out that a lot of people don't own uh, a drill press. They just have a lathe. And to me, that just opens up the opportunity to uh, go buy a drill press. <laughs> I mean, anytime you don't have a tool, you got to go buy a new tool. That's just written. Um, yeah. What I do is, let's see. Where was that drill? Is that drill truck back in here? Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Well, I had to come up with a way for people to do this on the lathe. Uh, particularly when you're teaching places that only have a lathe in the workshop. Maybe they have a bandsaw, but they don't have. What I came up with is I made this V-block. It's got a number two Morse taper on it. Now, you can turn away the middle part of the Morse taper because it won't matter. I was a camera repairman years ago, so I had this neat little vise. It's really handy for traveling. <laughs> um, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to bend this and then how to heat treat it to make the edge turn. It's just standard drill rod, high carbon drill rod. It hasn't been hardened. You can't harden high speed steel yourself. If you're going to make something out of high speed steel, buy it pre-hardened, grind the shape you want, and you're done. But um, where did I put that drill rod? It was right there. There it is. Now I use map gas because it heats up a lot faster when it'll go on the tube. There we go. And I also use fire bricks because, again, it heats up a lot faster. And also doesn't damage the lathe. <laughs> so, is the camera going to be able to zoom in on that? Yeah. <laughs> well, what we want to do is, I uh, see I need my bending jig that I put somewhere. Where did I put that thing? There it is. need both gloves. The way metal works is it's going to bend where it's hottest and thinnest. So you want to heat it up in the area where you're going to bend it. Um, so we'll, we'll heat that up. It's getting there. There we go. So then we'll just put it in here. And I'll say that's about where I want it bent right there. And I'll bend that. All right. That's not a bad angle. Now, to heat treat the steel, and I didn't bring a magnet with me. I'll be darned. Um, it's critical. You have to get it to what they call the critical temperature. Blacksmiths call it cherry red. Y'all know what cherry red is? I don't. I mean, I sort of do, because I've done this a lot. But if you heat it till it's non-magnetic, it's at the critical temperature. So usually I have a magnet with me, but today we're just going to heat it cherry red. <laughs>
That's about cherry red right there. You quench it, stir it around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you can buy oil hardened drill rod or water hardened drill rod. They call it W1 or O1. Um, if you use oil hardened drill rod, you got to use oil. The reason I don't use oil, of course, it creates a huge amount of smoke. <laughs> Could even burst into flames, depending on what you're doing. But what I've done now is I've hardened it too much. Well, I say hardened it too much. I've hardened it as much as it will harden by going to cherry red. What I want to do is I want to anneal it to get it to a hardness that's easy to sharpen, but hard enough to hold an edge. And most wood turning tools are hardened somewhere between Rockwell 58 and 62, give or take a little. By looking up some charts, and when you buy a drill rod, if you write the company, they'll send you a chart that'll tell you exactly what temperature you need to harden it, you need to temper it to if you want a certain hardness. And you can actually buy these things called temple sticks that they're like chalk, and you can, you can color it with that chalk, and when it melts, it's a, that exact temperature, plus or minus one or two degrees. So, I mean, you can really nail it. The way we're going to do it is we're going to, I've got to put this where I can find it. <laughs> yeah, we'll do it there. Um, we're going to heat it till it's straw color. Uh, straw color is roughly the temperature it needs to be. When you heat metal, and we'll start heating, and actually it's, the rod's going to get a little hot, so let's put it in my vice grips. <laughs> Normally I could do this without vice grips, but I'm going to heat it slowly to show you all what's going to happen. And when you heat it slowly, the heat travels down the handle. I was tips editor for American Wood Turner for about 10 years, and a guy wrote in a tip about, you know, how everybody gets uh, like copper, brass, sawdust, or whatever to put in their turnings to show off little details. This guy decided if you take a copper pipe and you put it against a disc sander with a piece of paper down there, it collects all this copper sawdust. What a great tip. So I went out to the shop to try it. I didn't have gloves on. I stuck that piece of copper in there and it heat traveled back in about two seconds. <laughs> I decided, okay, there needs to be an addendum to this article about safety. <laughs> so, oh, I traveled unbelievably fast. Um, what happens is this will turn kind of straw color, and then it'll turn kind of blue, and then it slowly turns to red. I got to get it in the light. If you look at it really closely, it's straw colored out here, kind of blue in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the torch and I'm going to watch that straw color. And when it gets out toward the tip, I'm going to quench it real quick. And that'll stop it at that particular hardness. Where it's blue, it's actually softer. So there we go. It's getting there. It's there. Pretty close, didn't quite get it. I missed it just a hair. But you kind of get the idea. The thing is, if you miss it, if you get it too blue instead of straw color, you can go back and heat treat it again. Heat it up to red hot, quench it, then go back and polish it, and then sand, or sand it and then put it in there. And you can see, I'm gonna try to put this in there. That end will be hot as well. There we go. And then what I would do is grind the shape that I want on the tip for a hollowing tool. I'll pass that around. Now one more quick thing before we go to lunch. And those stones are kind of hot, so make sure to get those. Uh, the latest craze, of course, is to make uh, carbide tools. Uh, they're very easy to make. You could take square rod and simply drill a hole in it, tap it, and put your carbide tool on top. You're better off, particularly on the round ones, just kind of shape this a little bit. Um, I'll do it with angle grinders. I'll do it on a sanding disc. You can file it if you're really good with a file. Take a hacksaw, make a bunch of cuts, whatever, to get it close. What I wanted to show you is tapping the hole. And the reason is, when you buy carbide cutters, um, 
there's tools I used to make, hook tools. You can make a hook tool the same way I just did a while ago. You grind the shape you want, you heat it up, bend it, and then go back and heat treat it, and then you got a hook tool. Um, when you buy carbide tools, they come with a, they should come with a screw that's tapered. The taper has to go down and has to match the taper that's on this. If I use the wrong screw, I can shatter my bit. So it's important to find out what screw you have that exactly matches that taper. And some of them are really, really tiny. And the reason I wanted to show you this today, as a wood turner, I mean, as a uh, camera repairman, I did a lot of tapping and grinding. Uh, these tools are also pretty easy to make. You can get a carbon steel, heat them up. They go on your cutting. What I found was a lot of times it's hard to drill a hole. You can take your angle grinder and cut a slot, which is much easier. Also, when you get ready to sharpen, you loosen the screw. You don't take the screw all the way out. Pull it right off and grind it. <laughs> works, works really good. Um, it's real important to use a tapping liquid of some kind. And I have a bottle laying around here someplace. I don't know where I put it. There it is. <laughs> um, you can use different kinds of oil. Some people take oil and kerosene, mix it. Uh, I got this from Trend one time, and it's really high quality stuff. It works great. The trick with tapping holes is do not flex the tap. They, they're extremely hard and extremely brittle. They will break. So you get it lined up perfectly square, which is hard. Usually I'm doing it down here. It's hard to do up like this. But what you want to do is you start the cut. If you keep forcing it, you can twist this and break it especially the really tiny ones, which a lot of those carbide cutters take. So what you want to do is you want to back up every half turn and break that chip. So I make a cut, I break it, make a cut and break it. Again, be extremely careful not to twist it like that. You'll break it. Okay, yeah, just a little bit in a minute. So, you know, like I do I every, every quarter. Now, it, on little bitty taps, sometimes you can only go a quarter of a turn. You'll feel it bind up. If it binds up, back it off. And break that chip and do it again. Uh, as a camera repairman, I've drilled holes <clears throat> using taps you can hardly see. <laughs> I mean, number one or number zero. Uh, and you just have to be patient and do it. I didn't bring a wrench to install that, so we'll just screw it in with fingers. <laughs> Okay, once, you know, once I get it through like that, I can go all the way, get it reamed out properly. But that's all there is to making a carbide tool. Um, the better, the flatter you can make this, the better the tool sits, the less chatter you get. So try to figure out a way to do that. Um, you can actually flex a hand file. Most people don't know that. But when you're filing, you almost always get a little bit of a crown. If you go back and you flex that tool as you're feeding it through, you can file off just the middle. Let's put that in there like that. And again, I didn't bring my wrench or my, there we go. That's good enough. Don't want to screw it all the way in. But that's all there is to making a carbide tool. Now one tip on making handles real quick, and then we'll call it Lunchtime. Um, two, two tips, actually. One is you can buy these carbide cutting, metal cutting tools real cheap. I'm talking 75 cents a piece. Um, they're too long. If you take a Dremel with a cutoff wheel and you score it, you can put it in a vise and break it right on that score line so you can get however long you need if you want to make a carbide cutter to go in your tools. Um, to make ferrules, um, I love all the different brass things. You can turn brass with your high-speed steel tools. I like the ones that are actually threaded because what I'll do is I'll cut the wood so it's just very slightly. It's just enough that I can force that thread on. I'll take a wrench and force it on there. Then I'll back it back off, put some epoxy on, put it back on, and then these are on there, and you can turn these again with high-speed steel tools. Any of our, our modern-day turning tools will turn them, uh, and they make great ferrules. Uh, Brass has gotten so ridiculously expensive now, something like that's six, seven dollars. 
They used to be a couple of bucks. Uh, you can buy, I like these copper end caps because you glue that on there, you can drill a hole the size you need for your, your tool handle. Um, I also buy these little short extensions. I use a pipe cutter to cut them off to length to use on there because you get two out of each one of these. They're a little cheaper than these end caps. Um, when I turn tool handles, I always drill a hole first in the blank and I use a cone center in my tailstock to go in that hole. That way the hole is always centered because I don't care how hard you try. When you try to drill a hole afterwards, it's never centered. Anybody got any questions? Uh, copper, tubing copper tubing works great, yeah. You know, if you got some that's, you know, some scraps, inch in diameter or whatever, or three quarters, whatever size you need, uh, you'll see most of my tools I showed you. Well, these were all, these were all brass. I thought I had some copper ones with me. Um, this is the brass. This is a, a screw thread to sweated fitting. It's out of brass. They're already tapered. It's got a hex part right there, but you turn away the hex part. Makes a great, a great handle. Yeah, that's all right. Drill, drill rod. What is for the, the little hollowing tool you made? Um, you have to go through specialty companies. Um, Fastenal carries drill rod. Uh, Grizzly carries drill rod. What drill rod is, it's just high carbon steel. The thing I bent today is just standard carbon. You buy it uh, Lowe's. It'll hold an edge okay. It won't hold an edge nearly as long as drill rod reel. The, the advantage of having drill rod is if you want a specific hardness. Let's say you're getting really picky about your tools. And you found that 58 is not hard enough. I want 62. Well, drill rod, because you can order the exact specifications of that rod, it'll tell you exactly what temperature you need to anneal to to get a certain hardness. 99% of the tools you made, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Just harden them up and you're okay. Uh, the, the tools I passed around, the uh, uh, captured ring tool, those were made out of high carbon steel. Uh, and again, you can buy it. I think I bought those from Grizzly. Uh, you can buy... Uh, if you go on the metal companies, you can buy large blanks of high-speed steel that are pre-hardened. They're very expensive, but they're really good to make scrapers out of, stuff like that. The, the problem is to try to make bowl gouges out of them or whatever, you need specialty tools to grind that stuff because it's pre-hardened. And, uh, and it takes very high temperatures at extremely exacting temperatures uh, to harden high-speed steel. Uh, that's the reason that when you buy Harbor Freight tools or or a lot of the Chinese off-brands, they may not hold an edge worth of crap because they didn't harden, harden them precisely enough. When you buy tools from Thompson or D-Way, you know they've been hardened and they've been cryogenically treated perfectly, <laughs> not half-assed like they do these other tools. And probably Sorby. I would assume they do a good job too. Yep. I've used a lot of Sorby tools over the years, and they're great tools. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. When you talk to the knife makers, Lordy Moses, <laughs> all kinds of different steels that they heat at all kinds of different temperatures. One of the tests that I did, I didn't tell you about that. I took a lot of flack a lot of times for making tools out of files. And I talked to a knife maker friend who made tools out of files. And he was a professional knife makers to be, I don't know, I don't, they don't really call it licensed. They, they, they take your, your, to get that degree or that certificate, they take your tool and they bend it at 90 degrees really harshly. If it breaks, you didn't anneal it properly, you know, whatever temperature they need to do. So I took all those files that I, when I was doing the testing and I put them in my big heavy duty vise and I hit them as hard as I could with my three pound hammer and broke them. And, and they either bent or didn't shatter. So I knew I was, well, the reason that you know, my knife maker was making these things and he said, no, if it's treated properly, they, they're good steel. They're not gonna shatter on you and not be dangerous. So I tried it, and like I said, I tested probably a dozen or more that I kneeled different ways and tried to beat them with a hammer, tried to physically destroy them, and wasn't able to hurt myself. <laughs> you know, so I knew, I knew then that it, what I was going to write this article about was safe enough to, and I had to argue that with the editor, too. I, I said, look, here's what I did, you know, and he went, okay. And so we wrote the article. But... Uh, Was 
Yeah, the cut's 50 degrees. 50. Well, I drill a hole. What I do is I take the metal and I drill a hole the size I want in both pieces. And then the, for the captured ring tool, I simply cut it off and then bevel it down until I had the angle I wanted. I, it didn't, I don't think the matter matters all that much because I'm using it kind of like a scraper. I'm not using it like D-Way tools. Um, the captured ring tool, you want it to be able to cut in both directions. So you put a bevel on both sides and you leave the tip of the tool perfectly square. So that way when I'm doing the captured ring, all I do is I tilt the tool up slightly so it, it presents an edge and it'll capture. Now the, when I looked at all the captured ring tools, you can grind one real quick out of a screwdriver. It doesn't really matter the shape. The problem is when you use an oddball shape like that, the, in, the inside of your V ends up like this, you have your ring. And it's really hard to sand those things down. You gotta glue sandpaper to the shaft and run the ring around in circles. And it's just hard to get it perfectly round. When you use a tool like I made, which I copied Sorby, uh, and, and I don't know why they arrived at that 50 degree angle. Well, I have some ideas, but what happens is that gullet acts like a depth gauge. You know, so I, I go in like that and then I start swinging it around. That gullet acts like a depth gauge. So now I know that both sides are gonna come extremely close to meeting. So I only have to sand off that little bitty tiny ridge and you get an almost perfectly round ring on the inside. Uh, high carbon steel. Yeah, I didn't order anything special. I just went to Grizzly and ordered, you know, whatever it was, three foot long rod <laughs> or bar of that stuff. And it, and it comes annealed, so it's easy to work with, you know, until you get, to, what I did was I went through that hardening stage at the very end, like I did anything else. Um, so it was an easy tool to make. How do you sharpen it? Um, you run a, a diamond hone across the top surfaces. You never really sharpen that, that lip. Mm -hmm. and, and what I do on rare occasions, um, you can buy this tool. This is a handy tool to have. Um, I've got the trend diamond. A lot of times I don't sharpen these with diamond hone very much anymore because I use that really small bevel and it's hard to find that edge. You end up rounding it over. But what I do is I take this cone shaped thing that I got from trend and you can buy these they're called fish hook sharpening tools you can buy that same cone at your fishing stores you go in here and you do like this and sharpen the inside it's almost the same as sharpening the outside it does an amazing job and it takes me about two seconds to do that a tiny bit the burrs wear off you know first 20 revolutions and you're turning 1200 rpm so it's gone in a heartbeat uh, i have on occasionally gone like this and removed the burr it's a waste of time, but I do it sometimes just for the hell of it. Uh, but that's a handy tool to have. Um, now, the reason I pulled that out was on extremely rare occasions on my ring cutting tools, my bead cutting tools, I will polish that inside surface. You don't want to do that very much because you change the shape of that ring if you do that. So 90% of the time, I take a hone and just polish the top, and that's all I do.